It is a great privilege to have with us today Jim and Janice Dearman. I think my, well, I guess my first acquaintance with the Dearmans would have been when Terry and I came to the Memphis School of Preaching in 1975. The Dearmans were already here. They had been here a year, which means he would have graduated in 1976, and then I would have in 77. But he was a great encouragement uh, to me uh, while I was in school, and he continues always to be a great encourager. He's always upbeat. He's always optimistic. He's always trying to, uh, of course, get the gospel out. It's been a joy to work with him in some uh, areas uh, overseas even as recently as this past year. We were on the lectureship together in uh, Singapore, and he and Janice had gone on up into uh, Malaysia, where they used to work. As I mentioned, Jim is a graduate of Memphis School of Preaching, 1976. He did mission work in the country of Malaysia until the Malaysian government said that uh, all foreigners there who are doing mission work had to leave. So it was getting, uh, they were tightening the ropes, so to speak, the noose, uh, on our work in Malaysia, especially as it related to foreigners. And so they had to get out of uh, Malaysia, but they were operating a school of preaching in Klang, Malaysia, which I think maybe was looked upon as kind of an extension of the Memphis School of Preaching. Now, you won't know, you won't guess who his co-worker was with him in Klang, Malaysia, but his brother Peter Chen. <laughs> and so uh, at that point, they, they did a lot of work, and so he left it in the hands of brother Peter Chen, and that continued on for a while. But prior to even coming to the Memphis School of Preaching, Brother Jim had a background in broadcasting and I think has a degree from University of Tennessee uh, in that field. And so he's always been interested in trying to use that tool of broadcasting uh, tool in evangelism, that is, get, reaching more people. And so he has worked with Truth for the World and various other uh, I think before Truth for Well, maybe it was Sound Words or something along that line. So it goes back quite a ways. But he currently has a television program. It's been in operation now for several years. We can view it in this area. He can tell us more about that. But it's good news for today. I know down in Tate County, Mississippi, we're able to pick that up and view it. And so we're glad for that. So he's going to be speaking to us today on the topic of open doors, specifically through the program, Good News for Today. Brother Jim. I told BJ I was going to wait till I could do it publicly to correct Billy because he's always wanted to call it Good News for Today, and the four is not actually in there. Oh. <laughs> but I wanted to embarrass him as publicly as I could. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm thankful, as long as he doesn't call it good news for tomorrow, that's fine with me. <laughs> but uh, good news for today is fine, that works. Some call it that, but uh, technically it's good news today. But uh, Billy is a joy uh, to be with, to work with, to travel with. You know, when Tim Burroughs was, uh, was talking about, or when uh, Billy was talking about uh, how it, good it was to travel with Tim and how easy it was to get along with him, I couldn't help but think that if, if you can't get along with Billy Bland, then you've got a problem. <laughs> but Tim, uh, Tim's easy to get along with also. But Janice and I were privileged to be uh, with them last November and uh, part of early December in Singapore at the lectures, and Janice talked the ladies there. And uh, it was a great joy for us because it had been 30 years for Janice since she had been back to Malaysia after we uh, had to make a, uh, an orderly exit, as Billy described it there, too. But I had gone back two years after we had come back to the States with Brother D. Mar Elam on a campaign and for the first graduating class of the Malaysia School of Preaching uh, there. And uh, Br Br Brother Peter Chen was the administrator in whose hands we had left that work, and he did a great job. He's doing a great job at Four Seas, he and his good wife, Pui Fun, just great workers in the kingdom. But 
Uh, Billy is a great travel companion. I, I just have to relate to you. He's always there to help you. We took a little time off to go to Chinatown in Singapore. And uh, while Janice was across the street uh, finishing up a sale and Tim Hayes was over, and he's a great co-worker too, as Tim is, and Jonathan Burns who were there, uh, I told Billy I wanted to get me a cap that had sing a baseball cap that had Singapore on it. So we went across the street and Billy was with me and we were walking around that uh, little shop and as I came back toward the front after browsing around there was just a little step down there about like that just enough to throw me forward when I didn't see it and I went into a a display case a metal display case that had hundreds if not thousands of little metal magnets Singapore souvenirs on it and I embraced that uh, display case and it kept going forward where we embraced another display case that was filled with scarves and then we hit the wall and then I went backwards and fell flat on my back without bracing my fall at all and as I was trying to evaluate whether I was going to live or die I had my wily e. coyote moment if you know what that is that's when you think it's over but it's not and I looked up and the metal display case was coming down <laughs> and I had no time to get my arms up and then so it hit me right in the face and I could taste blood in my mouth and I had blood on my arms and Billy was there to console me and he said you know something Jim if if it hadn't been for your nose that thing would have hit you right in the face <laughs> So Billy is a great comfort when you're on a trip. <laughs> He's always there to help. Well, in all seriousness, I don't know of a man who's more evangelistically minded than Billy Bland and who loves people and souls. And uh, I love him and appreciate him. And uh, he was a great, in great encouragement to us and always has been. I appreciate him more than I can express. And Tim, what a great report. It's been such a blessing for, for us to be here and to hear Brother Bobby last night and his outstanding presentation. I love and appreciate him, Brother BJ, and this school. So many wonderful memories uh, that we have of these two years spent here as students and then to be able to come back and teach for a while in the school um, and to be uh, co-teachers with men like Richard Curry, whom I admired and loved so much and uh, was one of my teachers and then to come back and to be able to teach with him for a while and Brother E.L. Whitaker. So many wonderful memories, you men who are here. Uh, this truly, I believe, will be uh, the greatest two years of your life in terms of uh, growth spiritually and um, I'm so grateful to this congregation, to the elders uh, here now and then, many of whom of course who've gone on to their eternal reward, but uh, we could not adequately express uh, how indebted we are and how blessed we've been as a family to, to be here and I am so thankful to be uh, invited to be a part of this event and I appreciate this event and my fervent prayer will be that it will continue uh, to grow in number and I'm so glad that uh, it is being streamed on the internet so that uh, hopefully more uh, people will be able to, uh, to, to see it and to participate. Actually my uh, broadcasting background Billy mentioned of course was in news primarily and um, it started when I was a senior in high school and a new radio station went on the air in my hometown of Smithville, Tennessee and, and I was uh, somehow selected as a senior in the high school to do a senior report for the new radio station once a week as I recall and so I did that and then I continued to have interest in broadcasting and then I think the day I graduated from high school and I was going to make a trip down to Chattanooga to be with some friends down there, a little high school uh, celebration trip, to, uh, I stopped at the station and was hired there to um, work uh, on a fairly full-time basis and then from there to uh, Murfreesboro for a while and then ultimately in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee and uh, to work there at a television station doing uh, news and weather there and then another radio station that was owned by a company that moved me to Nashville and then ultimately to Birmingham and it was in 
Birmingham that uh, the decision was made to come to the Memphis School of Preaching. And we were associated at that time with the Fine Shades Mountain Congregation. And they uh, were very supportive, as was the Adamsville Congregation that Bobby mentioned last night, where he was a member of a great congregation. And what a blessing it was to to come here and to make a transition from news to the good news uh, of the gospel. And I'll remember that Brother Frank D. Young, a man whom I loved and appreciated and admired, one of my fine instructors here who's gone on to his eternal reward, he gave us a sermon outline as students called Sound Words. And I thought, well, you know, that would probably be a good name for a radio program. And I had already determined, been hired to go to the West Concord Congregation near Birmingham and had already been asked to go back to the radio station I'd been working with and to do an early morning program with a co-worker. And it was only 6 to 9 a.m., so it wouldn't interfere with my local work. And the elders agreed to it. And they said, we'll give you a Sunday morning radio program absolutely free. Won't charge you anything. And so I determined to call it Sound Words. And so Sound Words began there in Birmingham, and then we began to add some other locations, some other stations. My hometown of Smithfield, and that little radio station where I uh, began broadcasting, they began to air it, as did some other congregations. And then we were Sound Words while I was here as a teacher at Memphis School of Preaching, and we began to get into television work. And then it was uh, determined that there was a denominational group calling itself Sound Words, and um, we didn't want to get into a legal battle, so we began to talk about changing the name, and we changed it to Truth for the World. And Brother Rod Rutherford, who was teaching here as a co-teacher with me, he was heavily involved in literature, and so that work evolved into a total approach to world evangelism, beginning with broadcasting, sowing the seed, and then doing follow-up campaigns and literature work, and uh, that work continues now with the uh, different folks involved, but it's continuing, uh, no doubt, to reach uh, many souls. And then, as I was in local work in Greenville, Tennessee, and had still done some work again with Truth for the World, Brother Don Blackwell was working there, and I was going down and helping some down in the Atlanta area where they were, I got a call from Barry Gilreath Sr., uh, a man who was that friend to me who sticks closer than a brother, without question, a man whom I loved dearly and whom we lost far too soon. But uh, he called about starting a 24-hour-a-day, a seven-day-a-week network, broadcasting nothing but the gospel. And we decided ultimately to call it the Gospel Broadcasting Network. That was my wife's idea because she was overhearing a conversation where brethren were sitting around talking about, what do we call this network? And she said, well, you're broadcasting the gospel and it's broadcasting and it's a network. Why don't you just call it the gospel broadcasting network? Uh, very creative, uh, I suggest. <laughs> and so that's, that's what we called it. And uh, she was a very important part of, of that uh, work. The program Counterpoint had its origin that BJ and Mike are still doing, and it's doing such a great amount of good. Read just recently in the GBN newsletter about conver a co conversion of a couple through that program. We got that idea from the old Crossfire program on CNN, and uh, two people sitting back and forth, and so that's how that developed. And it was a wonderful time, and that's where good news today. Uh, not good news for today, Billy, but good. that's where good news today had its beginning. It was the flagship program for several years on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. And at one point in time, we were producing six programs, 58 and a half minutes each per week. And I was the program director of the network, having been asked to be a part of the network from the beginning. Brother Don Blackwell was involved with the network from the beginning and has done a great deal of good, of course, for the network over the years and is now the executive director. And the network housed close by, though I'm not associated with it now officially, is doing a great work, obviously. And we're so delighted that that work continues to grow. Um, and so... Good news today, though, at one point in time, Brother Leroy Dedman, who was the operations manager of the network, said, good news today and GBN as separate entities might actually be able to accomplish a great deal more because the network needs a whole channel. 
And good news today, the flagship program just needs 28 and a half minutes or whatever uh, the length on various stations. So it could go some places that the network couldn't, and the network could go places that one program couldn't, obviously. So it was determined that the two could be separate but complementary works, and that happened around 2012. And it has worked well. Yeah, the network has grown, and good news today has also uh, grown. So that gives you some uh, history of uh, the beginnings of this work, the good news today, and um, also how uh, my work with, uh, with broadcasting from the standpoint of the work with the church uh, had its beginning. And we have been greatly blessed over the years. Going back to 2000, in seven, Brother James Andrews is here, and uh, he printed the book that had the sermons from the event in Nashville at the Ryman Auditorium. In 2007, it was determined that we would seek to do an event called GBN at the Ryman, the Tabernacle Sermons Today. And Brother Barry Sr. asked me to be one of the speakers to speak on the Great Commission. Brother B.J. Clark was another, Brother Garland Elkins and others participated in that event, and it was an exciting uh, event. In 2007, uh, my wife wrote the script for the book other than the sermons themselves, and James uh, printed it in his usual ex extremely uh, professional manner, and uh, the book is still around today, I guess, uh, those sermons. But each speaker was asked to deliver a topic that Brother Hardman in 1922, in that particular series of sermons that was used, had delivered at the Ryman Auditorium. And I'd like to hearken back to, to that occasion uh, just to compare some things that I was able to bring out in the lesson I was privileged to preach on that occasion, the lesson entitled simply, The, the Great Commission. It was pointed out that in 1922, when Brother N.B. Hardiman preached the Tabernacle Sermons originally, the population of the world was just under 2 billion. Just under 2 billion. The initial television signals by a man named Charles something or the other, I have it somewhere, it's in the book, but he had just begun some laboratory tests in sending television signals and radio, radio was reaching uh, more and more people and there was a boom in that, uh, in that medium and yet it had not yet reached Nashville and Brother Hardiman's sermons were taken down and then printed in the Nashville Tennessean, I believe, uh, during that time. So that gives you some perspective on where things were then versus where we were in 2007 when we revisited the Tabernacle Sermons at the Ryman Auditorium. At that time, there was just over 6 billion, and pop the population was just over 6 billion people. But Brother Bobby Liddell pointed out last night, as I recall, that now, in 2018, the population is around 7.8 billion. And as we think about the population growth and obviously what has been pointed out even with the, the number of missionaries that we have in the Lord's Church today, not, as, not nearly as many as we need to have and would want to have, there is, a, there is a huge gap between a burgeoning population and a rather minuscule missionary force. Is there any way for us to bridge or help to bridge that gap? And I believe the answer is yes, the media. Print media, print medium, broadcast medium, now the streaming, and it's being demonstrated right here at this event. But the Great Commission is still as current as it was when the Lord initially gave it to the apostles. The Lord never said when the population exceeds a certain number, then you're relieved of your responsibility to get the gospel to the whole world. He never said that. He said, go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And he said, of course, in Matthew's account, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world or the age. 
And so the gospel must be preached in every generation with a view toward getting it to every creature. On that occasion in 2007, I analyzed the, uh, the Great Commission in Mark's account of it in, in this way briefly. Go, go generically. Because go, and I think Bobby pointed this out last night, go is a generic term. He has not specified that we must go by plane or go by train or go by foot, but go generically, and that includes the electronic media. Go generically, but go into all the world tells us that we must go persistently. That if indeed a population of 7.8 billion is to be reached, we have to be persistent and constant in our effort to reach the world with the gospel. But that's the next point. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. We must never, never, never be dissuaded in any way by anyone from preaching the distinctive gospel of Christ. In other words, we must go distinctively. We must go distinctively. Never changing that message despite the changing times in which we find ourselves and despite the political correct society in which we find ourselves that is just lunacy in so many, in so many ways. We must make sure that it is the gospel that is preached because as Paul said, there is but one and there is not another, not another of the same kind at all in Galatians chapter 1. And so we're to go generically, we're to go persistently, we're to go distinctively, but he says, and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew's account and Luke's account talk about all nations, but all nations means every creature in all those nations because Mark's account, obviously what Jesus said there, says that we must go individually and that we must make sure that, that we are concerned about every precious soul in every nation of the world. And as Bobby again pointed out last night, how, how precious is one soul, Matthew 16, 26. If you preached, as he pointed out last night, for 40, 50, 60 years after graduating from the Memphis School of Preaching and you reached one soul, then every effort you had exerted would be well worth it. Well worth it. Jesus gave us such a beautiful illustration of the individual value of a soul in his encounter with a woman at the well. When you think about that, as he met a, a morally deficient, materialistically minded individual, and at the time the Lord was hungry, the Lord was thirsty, the Lord was tired, and yet he showed persistence and patience with her, so that ultimately the woman who had said, give me this water so that I don't have to come here to draw anymore, left her what? Left her water pot. Left her water pot. Forgot all about that physical water and went into the village of Syker and said, come, come here, a man who's told me everything I did. That was hyperbole. He hadn't told her everything she had done, but she knew she had heard enough that he could tell her everything she'd ever done if he so chose. And it was then that he told his disciples, look at the fields, for they are already white unto harvest. In that exchange there, which some have indicated, and perhaps accurately so, that the harvest about which he spoke was the harvest of souls that he saw at that time streaming out of the city of Sychar to come hear more about the Savior. And look at what that, look at what that effort with one individual resulted in and how many accounts are you familiar with about the influence of one individual person let me quickly tell you that recently I was asked to speak at the 150th anniversary of my hometown congregation in Smithville Tennessee and one of my assignments on Sunday morning at the Bible class was looking back grateful for the past and I was able to do some research about the late restoration preacher J.M. Kidwell who started the church in my hometown. I have a book in my library that was given to me when I graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching by Brother Frank Young on the life of J.M. Kidwell, written by E.A. Elam. And that book he thought would mean a lot to me, and he was exactly right, because that book had been given to Brother Young by my great-grandfather, T.H. Nixon, who was a faithful member of the church. And then Brother Young signed it and gave it to me. 
I used that book and the life and sermons of Jesse L. Sewell to talk about two men who influenced literally thousands of souls to obey the gospel. Jesse P. Sewell estimated that his grandfather had, had, um, had baptized as many as 10,000 people. It was said that J.M. Kidwell baptized over 3,000 people. But in my research, you know what I found? The Sewells, Jesse Sewell and his family had all been denominationalist until one of his brothers, William B. Sewell, married a member of the Lord's Church named Sarah Isabel Turner. And Jesse Sewell, when he learned what his brother had done, and he was communing, as they put it in the book, with the church, he went to his brother to try to teach him out of the error he perceived that he had gotten himself into. And in the process, Jesse Sewell himself was converted. Through the influence of whom? Sarah Turner. Thousands upon thousands of souls obeyed the gospel. And as I stood before the congregation on that occasion, I said, I myself might not be here had it not been for Sarah Turner. Because my family on my dad's side obviously was influenced to obey the gospel there in Smithfield back in the 1800s through that influence. We must go individually. But we also have to go expectantly. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We go expectantly. We go optimistically, anticipating that there will be precious souls who will obey the gospel. But we also have to finally go realistically. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so we can't be overly optimistic, but we have to temper that with the realism that Jesus reminded us of in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. When he said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate, uh, difficult the way that leads to life, and there are what? Few who find it. But let's go back to going generically. And that relates specifically to good news today and the work that we've been blessed to be a part of for several years now. We are overseen by the Dunlap congregation in Dunlap, Tennessee, where we now live, not far out of Chattanooga. We'd moved over into the beautiful Sequatchie Valley. And the Dunlap Church has overseen that work for some time now. And uh, Brother Freddie Clayton is the very fine, long-time gospel preacher there, having been there for some 23 years. We have 29 members of the church there who grade our Bible correspondence course courses for us and volunteer their time to do so. We have around 600 active Bible Correspondence Course students now. Many students that we get, or some students, we don't get a lot of overseas response, but we do get some, even from India, from England, other places. We coordinate that through International Bible Teaching Ministries, where Brother Ron Gilbert and others are, are uh, working and doing a great work out of the Cookville area. And so we simply uh, forward those to them, because if they're an email uh, student uh, requesting uh, the course by email, they can take their course by email, and it expedites the process uh, by doing that. And so we're grateful to them for their help uh, in that respect. The television program, and of course it's on some radio stations as well, uh, has really something going for it that is unique in our brotherhood. And I take no credit for that at all. I credit Barry Gilreath Sr. because initially when Good News Today began, he wanted it to be a magazine format program. And that magazine format simply means you've got different segments within that 28 and a half minutes now that are done by different speakers on an average of some three to five minutes each. And the attention span today is not what it perhaps used to be. And so we do have to be aware of the times in which we find ourselves. And that's the one comment, perhaps, that we get more than any other comment from those who've seen the program is that, that variety. I also learned something fairly recently that I thought was intriguing along these lines, not necessarily encouraging, but I was told by the agency in Arizona through whom we buy a lot of our television time, they give us opportunities. They'll say, hey, there's a station in Memphis and we can help you get that. They're a broker, in other words, and uh, 
GBN has used them, still does, and uh, we've used them for years. Lighthouse Media, they informed us recently that a survey that they had become aware of indicates that the average television viewer stays with a program for an average of 12 minutes. For 12 minutes. And um, uh, Eric Lau from that company said, it's, it gives your program somewhat of an advantage because of the magazine uh, format, but it also tells you that you need to do something within those first 12 minutes to hopefully uh, grab the attention uh, of an audience and hopefully keep them. Now, he said uh, there's a caveat, and that is that in a religious program, chances are those st those uh, that statistic may be longer because of the interest that someone has if they're tuned into a religious program. But the average of 12 minutes tells you that you need to draw them in as quickly as possible and hopefully keep them. And we do that by previewing the segments at the beginning of the program and hopefully previewing a final segment like our question and answer segment that has a question in it that hopefully will be appealing to as many people as possible. Sometimes in that final segment, instead of a Q&A, we will do a Bible commentary, we call it. In other words, a commentary on current events uh, from the biblical perspective. And uh, we find that to be effective. But some of the other segments that we have been using, of course, Brother Leroy Dedman does a segment called Leaving a Legacy. Uh, some humorous illustrations, but always with a strong spiritual application, and he does it beautifully. And it's a very popular segment. Freddie Clayton right now is doing walking and talking through Proverbs, uh, where he is doing that segment. Stephen Hall, a graduate of this school, has been doing a segment called Challenges. And David Smith, who preaches for the North Hamilton Church, does a segment called Be Ready Always, 1 Peter 3.15, giving that answer where he looks at a passage and a, and a position that someone might take and say, how do we, how do we answer that? It's a little bit similar to the counterpoint uh, concept um, that uh, BJ and Mike do such a wonderful job with. So we have these different segments. Of course, I begin the program with a devotional time consisting of our scripture reading, some beautiful singing and scenery, and then we come back for uh, um, an exegesis, a brief exegesis of that particular passage. So we do have that variety, and I credit Brother Barry Sr. with that concept uh, because it has been, uh, it's worked extremely well uh, for us and has, uh, has produced some very good comments. Speaking of comments, let me share uh, just a few that we have had, and I do encourage you to visit our display and uh, pick up a, uh, a newsletter and sign up for the newsletter. We'd love to be able to send you our quarterly uh, newsletter, but our coverage at this point uh, right now in terms of commercial stations includes Huntsville, Little Rock, Arkansas, Macon, Georgia, New Orleans, Louisiana, Sanford, North Carolina, Toledo, Ohio, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, La Follette, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, 9.30 on Wednesday nights here. We're back on now. We were on for a while, and we had to come off because of a funding issue. We're hopefully, we, hopefully we can get the funding necessary to keep it on for a much longer period this time. We get very good response out of Memphis. And the 9.30 p.m. Wednesday night time is good for members of the church who can go home from Bible study and watch the program after they after they get home. We're on in Nashville, a uh, uh, very good market there. We're on locally in the Sequatchie Valley now uh, to our local community. We're on in the Tri-Cities of Bristol, Kingsport, and Johnson City, and in Waco, Texas as well. And of course, we are on the Gospel Radio Network with the audio of the program. We're on the Gospel Broadcasting Network, I believe, four times a week. And we're also on all of GBN's uh, low-power FM stations in various markets uh, as well, and they carry good news today to Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and nationwide to Nigeria, Ghana, United Kingdom, and India, according to their um, coverage area. And, of course, television programs are archived at our website, uh, www.gntv.org. And uh, GBN, uh, cooperating with us, uh, gave us the information about the, uh, the app that we um, now have, the smart device app, 
so that you can go to your app store. Don't look for good news for today. Look for good news today. <laughs> you could probably still find it. It'll probably come up. <laughs> but uh, if you just go to your app store and uh, do a search for good news today, you'll see the yellow symbol with good news today. You can download it. And the beauty of that is that not only can you see the entire program there if you choose to do so, but we have also separated all of the different segments so that you can choose Leroy Dedman's Leaving a Legacy segment. And if you've got three or four minutes and you just want uh, a little devotional time with him, then you can watch that or any of the other segments that I have mentioned. And so that gives us some advantage from the standpoint, again, of that attention span uh, issue that uh, sometimes uh, uh, faces us. As far as some of the comments uh, that we get from our guest book online and, and from those who, who write to us, it has been encouraging. Um, I watch your program every Sunday morning. It is the best I have seen. I thought Janice, my wife, worded that very well. <laughs> I appreciate her. I appreciate her input on that. But um, we get them from uh, Bristol, Virginia, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, Chattanooga, Memphis. The, and here's the thing: some of these are identified as denominationalist, and uh, and yet they're very complementary. And so we know that hopefully we have some inroads potentially that could lead to some good things. Love the show. A Catholic viewer from Chattanooga tells us. A Catholic viewer from here in Memphis. I really enjoyed your program. Thrilling to hear good Bible teaching. A Baptist from Clarksville, Tennessee. I watch your program every Sunday. From Devonport, Tasmania in Australia. A member of the church. Uh, says, keep up the good work. Parish, Tennessee, a Southern Baptist, says, thank you for a good message and study this morning. A fallen away member of the body of Christ in LaGrange, Georgia, says, it was a blessing to hear the broadcast today. And from Cypress, Texas, a member of the church, watched your program for the first time and am very encouraged. And then from Trenton, Georgia, a member wrote, I love... I look forward to your weekly program on Sunday mornings. It is very helpful in getting my mind prepared for worship each week. Thank you for doing uh, such a great job. And it's not me, it's these men who contribute their time and give so much time and preparation uh, and so many others who make the program uh, possible. A Methodist viewer in Georgia wrote, hearing you for the first time has given me a greater desire to know more about the Bible and to live according to its uh, commands. Um, I have listened to, enjoyed, and benefit from your, benefited from your program for a number of years. I like the mix of segments. My wife and I were converted from the Calvinistic Dutch Reformed denomination. I miss the preaching and teaching of 50, 40, and 30 years ago. Your program is much like that. Please keep it on the air. I also keep praying for your work. And so we do get encouraging comments. And then not too long ago, Brother Tim Hall from up in Johnson City, a longtime preacher at the Central Congregation, informed us of a conversion of a prisoner in Mountain City, Tennessee, who is in prison for life. But he has opportunity to watch Good News Today in the prison. And Brother Tim informed us that the program had helped to lead him to the truth. And they were able to get to him. And they're able now, after baptizing him into Christ, they're able to visit with him on a fairly regular basis and to encourage him. And he's enrolled in our Bible Correspondence Course program uh, as well. So it is something that I think we need to fully appreciate in terms of not just good news today, in terms of how it can help to supplement uh, the work that men are doing on the field and the sacrifices that they are made. But it's my, it's my firm conviction that a media work of some kind should be uh, obviously a good sound kind. doesn't have to be good news today. But it's my conviction that every congregation should include in its uh, budget uh, of support as an evangelic, evangelistic outreach, some good media effort uh, in conjunction with everything else that is being done because it can help, in many cases, it can help those who are actually on the field where you can place programming where it can be heard by those who are working in that same area on the field. And um, so I am uh, obviously for many, many years have been a very strong believer, a very strong believer in, uh, in broadcasting. And especially in light of the burgeoning population as we've outlined it briefly and as it has already been pointed out in this series of meetings, 
that burgeoning population and that relatively minuscule missionary force, uh, how can we bridge the gap? And I think the media provides a very important answer. But we must do it distinctively. We must do it persistently. We must do it the way God has charged us with doing it. We may live in a time where, and tragically, far too many, and times many, many uh, in the church perhaps, are looking out for themselves rather than looking at themselves. And as we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word, we need to lift up our eyes and see the fields, as the Lord told his disciples on that occasion, that they are white for harvest. Look up, said he, there is a sea of souls outside your door. Content with me he cannot be if I those souls ignore. I dare not wait, could be too late. Tomorrow may never be. Oh, tragic fate, there's none so great as to be lost eternally. Thank you.